Welcome to chapter 13, which is the third declension nouns. This will be a big chapter for us because it will be the closing down of our understanding of the nouns. We've already mastered the second declension nouns in the masculine with lagos and the neuter with hiteron, and also the first declension nouns largely feminine with grafe. Now it's time to tackle the third declension nouns, which are actually the most complicated. These, instead of having singular paradigms, we will actually learn to chant three of them, and that will give us a sense for several other options that happen with this uh, consonant ending noun form. The nominative, genitive, dative, accusative uh, meanings and things will be exactly the same as the other one. It's just with this third declension noun, because of the consonantal ending, the endings and the noun root itself will shift around as the consonants collide. And that'll be the only difference, not the meaning of the various cases. The good part is that this third declension nouns will finish off all the forms we need to master the nouns of the Greek New Testament. So this is the end of the nouns for us, and that will be a major milestone. Well, let's jump in and look at third declension nouns. In second declension nouns, they were considered omicron ending nouns. They were usually masculine or neuter. So, for example, you had things like logos. And it was called an omicron ending because if you pop off the sigma, the logos, it ended with omicron. Other words of the second declension that we're familiar with are things like theos, doulos, laos, oikos, nomos, uranos, apostolos, adelphos, cosmos, and huios, all omicron ending, masculine, and then heteron type nouns would give you to the neuter. If you pop off the noon ending, you're left with an omicron there as well. So the second declension, masculine and neuter largely. The first declension nouns ended in an eta or an alpha, and so they were nouns usually feminine, like graphe, agape, aletheia, basileia, mathetes, prophetes, and hora, usually feminine, ending with the alpha and eta ending. For many of the forms, the nominative has the alpha eta ending on the nominative form. Third declension nouns are consonantal ending nouns. And so these will be words like charis, which is grace, pistis, which is faith, and onoma, which means name. <coughs> In order to find the consonantal ending, however, you just don't pop off the ending on the nominative. You've got to go to the genitive form, which in all our nouns, do you notice that we've been listing the genitive form? This is the reason why. In the third declension noun, in order to discover the root, you've got to go to the genitive and then pop off the omicron sigma ending, and that will give you the root stem. So the genitive form will be very important for us because the modifications will come off the genitive form as the endings are added. We'll have endings that are vocalic, that is, add a vowel onto the ending, with usually not much shifting, and then we'll have consonantal endings, which will clash with the consonants of the roots in various modifications, some of which we already know from our sigma addition, will happen, making great variation to this third declension noun. But, because you're the brightest and best, you'll be able to sleuth it out and figure out the root forms, the case of these third declension nouns. Let's take a look at the third declension endings. We'll first look at the masculine feminine. For the nominative singular, it's a simple sigma. The genitive is an omicron sigma. The dative is an iota. And the accusative is an alpha, but then sometimes is a noon. The plural is epsilon sigma. The genitive is our normal genitive plural, own, which we've seen before. And the dative is a sigma iota. 
And finally, the accusative plural is an alpha sigma. Now you'll notice on the nominative singular and on the dative plural, there's an initial sigma, which is a consonant, which is going to run into then the consonants on these roots that we're going to attach it to. So those two places, the nominative singular and the dative plural, are where we're going to see some uh, consonantal gymnastics. The others are mediated by a vowel, so the divergence won't be as great at all in these other cases. So just largely the nominative singular, the date of plural, keep your eye on those. Now jumping over to the neuter, go down to the genitive singular, it's omicron sigma, dative is yoda, genitive plural is own again as we'd expect, the dative plural is, is sigma yoda again, so the genitive and dative are exactly the same as what we have in the masculine feminine. The only place the neuter differs is in the nominative singular, where there's a null form, nothing's added. In the plural, an alpha is added, both in the nominative and the accusative. So as we've seen before in the neuter, the nominative and accusative forms are exactly the same. So this gives us an overview of, of these endings that are going to be attached. Now the problem is that when these endings get attached, there's going to be some consonantal clashing that we're going to have to keep track of. But we know some of that already due to our sigma addition patterns. Do you remember in the future when we added the sigma there, how the consonants shifted? We're going to have that same type of pattern happen here because in the nominative singular, date of plural, we've got that same sigma hitting into some similar consonants. This is a good place to review our sigma addition. Do you remember the labials, the p, -b -f -p beta, phi? When you add the sigma, it becomes a psi. We did that in the future tense. The palatals, kaga ka, kappa gamma ki, plus the sigma, becomes an xi. And then the tedatha, the dentals, tau, delta, theta, when you add the sigma, it just simply reduces to a sigma. So this pattern will be found, the same pattern here as was found in the future tense. The Greek prefers these three letters as, as consonantal endings to their nouns. That will be the noon, the rho, and the sigma. The other consonants will clash and modify should mention at this point too that sometimes this third declension will have an iota or upsilon ending. You say, well, an iota and upsilon are not consonants, but the role that they play in the third declension nouns will be as kind of semi-consonants. So the iota and upsilon are going to stay strong and hang in there um, as kind of semi-consonants, which would be nice because when we add the sigma, the consonant on, It'll flow nicely because uh, the yoda can go and the upsilon can go as a vowel too. So, those are some of the variations we're going to expect. Let's take a look at some of these. Let's look at a few of these third declension nouns where there's consonantal clashing. Sarx, for example, begins with the root form sigma, alpha, rho, kappa. You add the sigma and it gives you the sarx, which is your lexical form, means flesh. Notice the kappa and the sigma collide and give you the xi. Now how do you get back to the root, the sigma, alpha, rho, kappa root? You basically look at the genitive form, which is sarcos. And it has the omicron sigma ending that you pull off the ending and, and you find that there's a kappa behind it. Similarly, alpide, when you add the sigma, becomes alpice, which means hope. You'll notice that the delta, which is a dental, when you add the sigma, the delta drops out. There's no hope that you would have ever figured out if you have the form alpice, that you should put a delta in there. It's gone in the nominative. Where does the delta occur? It occurs in the genitive singular with the Omicron sigma, you pop the Omicron sigma off, the delta is left there. 
so the root genitive singular form is critical. Now the karit form, when you add the sigma, becomes karis. It ends in a, when the tau, which is also a dental, when you add the sigma, it drops out. And so karis is grace. But the tau will reappear in the genitive, dative, accusative, singular forms, and also for the genitive plural and accusative plural. Now pater, when you add the sigma onto the end, do you remember how we said that the rho and the noon were good ending nouns? Well, here you have father, pater, and the sigma was added at the end, and it just dropped, and you are left simply with the rho ending. It's okay to end the noun in the rho, so the sigma just drops out. Hero. When you add the sigma, it's got a upsilon ending. Remember we said some of them have an iota or upsilon ending. And so this one has an upsilon ending, and the sigma just flat goes on to it. So he arus is our word for priest. The sigma is a consonant, but when some of the vowel endings occur, the upsilon actually drops out. Now the word piste, when you add the sigma, becomes pistis. Again, the oda is not a consonant, but semi-consonantal means faith, pistis. When you add the sigma, the sigma sticks then, and it becomes pistis. But you'll notice on when the chant that we're going to learn, that sometimes when you have the vowel endings, it'll actually cause various transformations, although a lot of times the yoda hangs in there. So these are just some patterns on the types of things that happen with these third declension nouns. Now we're going to learn three chants. We're going to learn a chant for caris, which means grace. We're going to learn a chant for pistis, which means faith. And we're going to learn a chant for onoma, which means name. And these will give us three types of third declension nouns that we just have down as a chant without even thinking about them. And these will give us paradigms and models for how many of the other third declension nouns are formed. Not all of them, but many of them will be formed according to these three patterns that we're going to learn next. Our first pattern is for caris. You see the genitive form is caritos. It had the tau ending. When you add the sigma, the tau drops because it's a dental. It's got the hey article, so it's feminine. The chant then goes like this. Caris, caritos, cariti, carita, caritas, cariton, carisi, caritas. Let's try that one more time. Caris, caritos, cariti, carita, caritas, cariton, carisi, caritas. And one final time. Caris, caritos, cariti, carita, caritas, cariton, Carisi caritas. You'll see that in the accusative singular, carin is an alternative form. Pistis is our second chant. You see the genitive form is pisteos. When you add the os ending on, the yoda seems to go to an epsilon in many of the cases in the genitive, dative, nominative plural, genitive plural, dative plural, and accusative plural. It's also feminine because the definite article is hey. So the form that we chant is this. Pistis, pisteos, piste, pistein, pistes, pisteon, pistesi, pistes. And once again, repeat it with me. Pistis, pisteos, piste, pistein, pistes, pisteon, pistesi, pistes. And one final time. Pistis, pisteos, piste, pistein, pistes, pisteon, pistesi, pistes. Now that's two out of three. One more to go. Our third chant is going to be onoma. You can see the genitive form is onomatos. It takes the to article, so it's a neuter. 
Now we're going to switch the, because the accent jumps around on this, and we, so for this one, we'll place the accent on the ma. The ma is consistent with all the forms, so we'll just accent that one. Make it easier to remember at this point. So it's onoma, onomatos, onomati, onoma, onomata, onomaton, onomasi, onomata. And once again, say it with me. Onoma, onomatos, onomati, onoma, onomata, onomaton, onomasi, onomata. And one more time. Onoma, onomatos, onomati, onoma. Onomata, onomaton, onomasi, onomata. One other one that we'll look at, but uh, this won't be a chant, but just so you can see how the kappa and the sigma collide, and there's that uh, sigma addition thing going on here, is the word sarx, means flesh. The genitive form is sarkos. So you can see that if you pop the omicron sigma ending off, there's a kappa on the ending. So it's a kappa ending noun, third declension. And the nominative form is sarx with a C. That's because the sigma and the kappa go to an C. The genitive is sarkos. The dative sarki. Accusative sarka. The plural nominative is sarkes. The genitive plural is sarkon. And then the dative plural, which is again the sigma colliding with the kappa, is sarksi with a movable noon. Then the accusative plural is sarkas, as we'd expect. So just uh, be aware of the variations in the nominative singular in the dative plural with the colliding of consonants. Don't memorize this form, but just so you can see the patterns that reoccur. A very important little word is the word pas, pasa, pan for the masculine, feminine, and neuter forms of this adjective. It's a 313. Instead of usually we've seen our adjectives being 212, this is a 313, and it means all, every, or each. And as you look down the masculine column, you can see that it's pas, pantos, panti, panta, which follows simply the third declension pattern with the noon tau ending and dropping when the sigma is added on the, in the nominative. The feminine is pasa, pases, pase, pasan, which is the normal first declension noun with a alpha in the nominative and accusative and, and the genitive and dative have an eta. And then the neuter form is pan, and it again returns to the third declension noun where you have pantos, panti, which is exactly the same as the masculine genitive. And then you have the nominative and accusative being exactly the same, pan. So this is the singular of pas, meaning all, each, or every. And this is just an example of a 313, emphasizing the third declension type of adjective. The plural forms of pas are totally regular. The masculine is pontus, ponton, pasi. Notice the sigma gets added, the noon tau drops out again, as it did in the nominative singular, and then pontus. The feminine form, absolutely regular, pasai, pason, pasais, pasas. And the neuter, exactly what you'd expect for a third declension neuter, panta, panton, pasi, again the data form, the noon tau dropping out because the sigma gets added, and the panta. So these are the forms of pas, pasa, pan, a 313 adjective that will be very frequent in the New Testament, as the word all is used very frequently, sometimes in hyperbole, and sometimes meaning each or every, not necessarily always meaning all. A couple of translation examples for our third declension nouns. Kari sumin kai erene apo theu 
patros hemon, charis, who mean, grace to you, and peace, erene, from God, apo theu, patros hemon, our father, the genitive form of patros. The second example is hos and tais hemerais tais sarcos autu who hos relative pronoun and tais hemerais in the days tais sarcos the genitive form of his flesh autu sarcos genitive form of sarcos This is no problem because it's the same, the nominative genitive dative accusative has the same meaning in the third declension as it did in the first and second. No problem. Just remember Caris, Pistis, Onoma, and you'll have it down. Well, this is a time for celebration and congratulations. This is a major milestone in Greek. You've got all the basics down for all the nouns now. The two one twos kind of thing, the second declension, first declension, and now the completion of it with the third declension. Dan Wallace notes in his advanced grammar that there are 28,957 nouns total in the New Testament. The verbs is about 28,109 verbs, about equal between verbs and nouns. And you've got the ability to take all the nouns apart now for the nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, and even the vocatives. For the nominatives, there's about 7,794 the genitives almost equal to that is 7,681. Dative's less frequently. As we said, the dative is going to die out, and in modern Greek, it's going to disappear altogether, being replaced by largely the preposition n. So the dative is down to 4,375. The accusative back up at 8,815. The accusative being the most frequent because the nominative is already given in the verb, and so the accusative is, is the most frequent case in the New Testament. The vocatives, about 292 of those, and those will be oftentimes the exact same form as the nominative. Just a big congratulations at this point. You've got the nouns mastered, or you will have after you get the chance down. Adding caris, pistis. Onoma to our logos, graphe, hieron. The vocabulary for chapter 13. The first word is aner, and it means man or husband. The second word is basoyus. and it means king. The third word is dunamis, and it means power or miracle. The fourth word, onoma, and it means name. The fifth word is our adjective pas pasapan and it means each, every, or all. Our sixth word is pater and it means father. Our seventh word is pistis. And it means faith or belief. The eighth word is pneuma. And it means spirit or wind. 
The ninth word is sarx. And it means flesh or body. And the tenth word is charis. And it means grace or kindness.